We're in the middle of a little uh, series called Salvaged. And it's a story about how God has come to us to rescue us, to repurpose us, to give us meaning in our life, yes, indeed, to salvage us. Over the last two Sundays, uh, we, we began on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. And on that eastern slope of the Mount of Olives, we found out that Jesus came alongside Mary, the, the sister of a man by the name of Lazarus who had died. And Jesus identified with her. He walked with her emotionally. He felt what she felt. And the scripture says that he cried with her. The, the, the Greek word there is a word that means to do with. And when he came to the western slope of the Mount of Olives and he was coming down and looking at Jerusalem, the Bible says he wept. And that word is the the word to to cry over. And he was crying over the brokenness and the the hardness of, of people's hearts. It wasn't but seven days ago that we rode into Jerusalem with Jesus on what's called Palm Sunday as the people would wave those palm branches that would fall to the ground and their coats would be thrown on the ground in front of him because they were hailing him as king of the Jews. They were crying out, Hosanna, save us, what the word means. They are awaiting their long-expected king. And this morning, we come to Resurrection Sunday morning. It's Easter. And I've got news for you this morning. It's good news and it's great news. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. It's the best news. Now, this morning, when we talk about that, we come as a church and we celebrate Easter. As I was driving in this morning, uh, the Destin Methodists were down here at the Crab Trap, and man, that place was packed. I said, there's not going to be anybody left for the other churches to go. But, you know, there's plenty of folks, and we all recognize, and we come together on a day like this. And this morning, as we come together Because of that, I want us to consider the implications of the intrusion of God's love through Jesus Christ. Because the Bible tells us, for God so loved the world. In John 3.16, the Bible declares, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus came from the Father. By the power of the Holy Spirit to bring us back to the Father, Jesus came to reestablish, to rescue, to salvage our lives for the purpose of our very being. And today, we've come to celebrate that. And as we dig in this morning, I want to invite you just to join with me in a moment of prayer. Father, as we are gathered in this room today, Lord, we come from all different walks of life. And we come from very many different positions in life. Lord, some of us are are on a spiritual mountaintop and we're rejoicing. And others, we are in the depths of the valley of darkness and despair and we're looking for hope. And and some of us, Lord, are just kind of going along and doing life every day. But Lord, today we declare that we need you. We need your salvage in our lives. We need your touch in our lives. We need a freshness and a newness that we have personally maybe never had. And Father, we just ask you to speak mightily in this time. For it's in Christ we pray. Amen. In John chapter 1, verse number 1, I think it's important to realize as we look at this topic of resurrection that we need to understand why there's a a salvage process anyway. And it's going to take us all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. But in John chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible declares this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And this morning, I want to propose to you something that could seem radical to you, something that could be dramatic to you. Maybe you don't think about this on a daily kind of a basis, but this is something I want to propose, and it's this, that God is present, not absent. And if there's any one thing I want you to be able to take home with you today, is this, God is present, not absent. 
I had a little four-year-old little fella come up to me at that aisle at the end of the last service, and his daddy said, tell the preacher what you learned today. And he looked up and he said, God is present, not absent. If a four-year-old can get it, we can all get it. I want us to grab a hold of that. God is present. God is not absent. You know, there's a lot of dark thinking in this world, like we're, you know, far from God, and God has no idea of where we are and who we are and what we're doing and what our needs are, as if we're completely separate from and detached from God. You know, if, if, if we think uh, that of, of all creation, that it's detached from its creator, you know, it's a wrong-headed, dark kind of thinking. You know, I think most every one of us have blown bubbles. Anybody never blown a bubble? Everybody in the room's blown a bubble. You know, you take the little dipstick, you put it in the bottle, and you blow this bubble, and you have become a creator of sorts. And that bubble comes into existence, and it's immediately detached from you. It's detached from the little dipstick, and it begins to drift. And you may watch the wind uh, take it just a little bit, but eventually it winds its way down to the ground until it touches maybe a blade of grass and pop, it's gone, and, and off you go to other things. You never were concerned so much about that bubble. You didn't cry over that bubble when it popped, unless you were maybe two years old, that your bubble popped. But, you know, it was, it was that kind of a thing. And a lot of people think that God is like that, that he set us into motion, he set us into existence, and he's let us go, and he lets us drift, and we eventually wind down to nothing. And so we believe this lie that, that God doesn't care. We believe the lie that he doesn't love, that he's not for us, that he isn't life-giving and he's not life-sustaining. And we begin to believe the lie that God must be something else. And so many people, they think of God and, and, they're able, and, and they think of him as, as hardly able to wait to judge us and to condemn us and to sentence us. And that leads us to a relationship of fear. And this is what happened in the Garden of Eden. Here was Adam and Eve and, and the beauty of God's creation. The Bible tells us in Genesis 1-1 that God created the heavens and the earth. He created the heavens and the earth. And as we read into the next three chapters, we find out how he created everything. And he created man and he created woman. And, and, and Adam and Eve at that time, they walked in this beautiful relationship. A beautiful relationship with the Father. It was an intimate relationship. They, they knew God. God knew them. It was a fulfilling relationship. It was everything that they could ever hope for, everything that they could possibly ever need. They walked in that relationship. But something happened. There was a serpent. It was uh, Satan. He was, descri he was uh, uh, um, disguised as a, as a snake. And he comes slithering in. And they believe the lie that he speaks. God doesn't really love you. God doesn't really care about you. God really doesn't have your best interest in mind. If he did, he'd say, go ahead and eat this fruit. And so they believe the lie and they partook of the fruit. And what they, they, um, they, they discovered in eating that, uh, that fruit is they knew immediately that that relationship that was intimate, where they knew God, that was fulfilling, where he was everything they, they thought they ever needed, that, that it had been broken, and they hid in fear. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse number 9, the Lord called to the man, and he said to him, he said, where are you? Where are you, Adam? And it was not a question of geography. It was not a question of geography. But it was a question of concern. In other words, Adam what is this confused place of darkness that you've gone to? Adam, I love you. And even God coming and calling out Adam because God knew already. God was showing us that in our darkest and in our, our deepest failures, that God is present not absent. God is present, not absent. And so throughout the pages of Scripture, we see again and again that God is present, not absent. He's with us. He seeks us out. He comes into our darkness that we may be salvaged, that we may be rescued. He asks, where are you? He asks, what are you doing? He says, I love you. He says, come walk in the light. Walk in my love. Come back to me. The psalmist declared in Psalm 120, verse number 1, he said, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. 
In Psalm 121, verse number 1, he says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. The psalmist knew what was true. What he was making the declaration in is that God is present, not absent. God has come. And the Father has come by the power of the Spirit in Jesus the Son. And Jesus has come into the darkest darkness of our world, to the very darkest places of our sin and our brokenness and our rebellion and our loneliness and our dis- desperation. Jesus has come into the darkness declaring, I will make the Father known. He's come declaring, I will bring His love and grace. He has come to the darkest places to be God's love with us. Matthew records these words and says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, meaning nothing other than God with us. And Jesus comes and he submits to that darkness. In John 1, 5, the Bible says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The darkness never overcomes the light, but the light comes into the darkness. And Jesus bears the brunt of that darkness. The Son of God, God with us, bears the brunt of the darkness of sin. Now, we have all sinned, have we not? You know, sin is missing the mark. It's doing something wrong. If you have driven in our traffic, you have probably sinned. And there's nothing like having road construction going on, right? They tell us we're going to have six lanes in the next ten years out there. And it's going to ease. I don't quite believe it, but we'll see. But we all sin. And we deal with these things called transgressions. A transgression is a breaking of a law. God says, don't you step there and you do it anyway. And these iniquities, and iniquity is all about our attitude. It's an attitude, well, God, I don't need you. No, I don't believe in you. I'm going to go my way. Leave me alone. Get out of my school. We're not going to talk to you in prayer. We're not going to read from your word. You know, it's that attitude. And this is what allows us as people. It allows us as people to to spit upon him and to crucify him. It's the iniquity of us all. Isaiah the prophet said in Isaiah 53, 6, All we, all we, like sheep have gone astray, we've turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so people, you know, when Christ was crucified, they literally turned away from him. And he continues today, people literally turn away from Christ every single day. And so in John 1, 11 and 13, the Bible says he came to his own and his own did not receive him. They turned away. They turned away. But even though we've turned away and we continue to turn away, this one truth becomes evidently clear over and over again. God is present, not absent. God is present, not absent. And so God continues to come. God is present and and He's not absent. He's here. And what I can begin to understand is there's no place in my life that is so dark that God is not there. Even in the midst of the darkest darkness, God is with us and we're called to turn from that darkness and we're called to walk in His marvelous light. I mean, think about in the Bible where God has shown up. Think of what's the darkest dark place you can think of perhaps in the Old Testament. To me, it would be a place called Sodom and Gomorrah. It's a, it's a total attitude, it's a total heart, it's a total culture of debauchery and, and wickedness. Sodom and Gomorrah, you may remember it. God said because of their wickedness that he was going to cast down judgment. And fire and brimstone came down and totally obliterated Sodom and Gomorrah. But God was there. There's a man there by the name of Lot, and God sends two messengers, two angels to Lot, and they come from, they come there on the on the purpose of rescue because God is absent, not absent. He's always present. God is present, not absent. 
And Lot takes his family and they leave before that judgment falls. There's a triad of of characters we know and we recognize them as well named Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Y'all remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham, and I'm one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Father Abraham. Father Abraham's the father of Isaac, and and Isaac's the father of Jacob. And Jacob is the second-born child of Isaac. He's a twin. His brother Esau's born first. They wrestled in the womb, and when uh, when Esau was born, he came out first, and Isaac, uh, and, and And Jacob was hanging on to his heel, like, hang on, I'm not letting you go. I'm not letting you out first. That was going on. And Jacob, we know him in the Bible. He's quite the character. As a matter of fact, he's a trickster. He, 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 he's pretty quick, you know, you better uh, read everything he's written into the contract kind of a guy. And he cheats his brother Esau out of his birthright. A birthright in that day was a big time deal, you know, the firstborn son received all this from the father. And Esau comes in one day, he's been out hunting, he's, he's uh, Isaac's favorite, and he's been out hunting and he comes in, he says, I'm about to die, let me have some of that stew you've been cooking. And Jacob said, "Uh uh-uh, let's make a deal. I told you, you got to be careful these deals you make with Jacob, right? And this deal he makes was this. He said, Esau, if you want to eat and not die right now, you got to give me your birthright. Now, Esau didn't think anything of his birthright. He didn't value his birthright. There's a lot of stuff going on there. We could talk for days about that. So he said, sure, I'll give you my birthright. And then when Esau realized exactly what Jacob had gotten out of him, man, he was mad. He was going to come put a whooping on Jacob. And Jacob ran for his life. He ran for his life, and he goes running out through the wilderness, and and he becomes somewhat tired. And, And he finds himself in this wilderness exhausted. He lays down to rest, and he takes a stone for a pillow, and he has a dream of a ladder that's come uh, um, from heaven to earth, and the angels ascend and descend, a stairway to heaven, so to speak. And Genesis 28, 16 tells us, Then Jacob awoke from his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord's in this place, and I did not know it. He's in a place of deep, dark despair, running for his life, using a stone for a pillow, and he says, Surely God is in this place. God is present not absent. There's another character in the Old Testament by the name of Moses. Moses had been raised in the courts of Pharaoh for his first 40 years. He, he knew a, a life of privilege. He, he knew a, a life of wealth. He, he knew a life of being served. And yet one day he was out and he noticed an Egyptian guard being mean to a Hebrew and He took it upon himself to issue punishment, and he killed that Egyptian guard, and he began to run for his life. And for the next 40 years, he'd be on the backside of the wilderness of Midian, herding sheep. He'd given himself over to a pointless existence. And and then there's this burning bush. And we read that when he saw the bush, that the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, and God called out to him from the bush, and he said, Moses, Moses. And he said to him, here I am. He's now 80 years old, and his life is rescued. His life is repurposed. His life is salvaged. He's brought from hopelessness and despair in a desert where he finds the presence of God and not his absence He's living with an attitude of being undone and without hope, but he discovers God is present. He's not absent. And here God salvages the life of this man, and he salvages the life of a nation. The story of God is a story of love. For God so loved the world. It's a, it's a story of mercy, his, his emotion over us, his, his crying over us, his concern over us, his attitude towards us. It's the story of his grace, bringing that mercy into into action. It's the story of his presence and not a story of his distance. 
And when we think in our own dark thinking and in a confused and sinful thinking, we believe there's no God and we believe there's no hope. We're like that, that bubble that we've created and, and we're just out there and we're drifting along until eventually we wind down and we pop and there's nothing left. There's no connection. There's no hope and there's no salvation. And yet God draws near and he comes again and again to tell us God is present, not absent. In the book of Daniel, we come across three other characters by the name of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The king had given a decree, everybody's got to bow down to me and worship me as God. That was his decree. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we will not. Everybody bow down. These three men are standing in the congregation. They're not going to bow down to the king. They say, we will not bow down to anyone except the Lord God Almighty. And the king was angry, and he made a decree, you'll be executed and be thrown into a fiery furnace. In other words, a big old furnace they, they threw them into. I mean, nobody's going to survive that. And they, they, they throw them in, and the furnace is, blow, is burning. And as they gaze in, they don't see just Shadrach, Meshach, in Abednego, they see a fourth one as a ghost almost. It's the Lord there. And even in that fiery furnace, we discover this truth. God is present. He is not absent. In the coming of Jesus Christ, the Father sends His Son to rescue, to salvage, to bring us back to the Father. We read in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, and 10 through 11, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. He is in the world. And the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. And so, here Jesus is. All these people, you know, they're, they're not receiving him, but he's called out these 12 men to be his disciples who follow him. And on this journey over the next three years, they see amazing, wonderful, awesome, glorious things happen along the way. I draw your attention to a couple of stories. One of the stories is, is the story of, of, a, of a man who's paralyzed. He's living in the darkness of being paralyzed, living in the darkness of not being able to get up and go and take care of himself, living in the darkness of not having mobility. But he's got four friends that are concerned about him. Four friends. And Jesus makes a surprise visit to their village, and, and these four friends are so concerned, they come and they take this paralyzed man, and they bring him to see Jesus at the house where Jesus is staying. But the house is crowded. There's no way they can work through that crowd to get inside. But their concern didn't stop there. They went up on the roof, they peeled the tiles of the roof back, and they lowered this man down in front of Jesus. And in his darkness and in his despair, Jesus gave him the word of forgiveness. He gave him the word of healing. He gave him the word of hope. And for what this man came to know was God is present. He is not absent. And Jesus speaks forgiveness and miraculous salvage occurs. There's another character, a lady from a Samaritan village. Most of us know her as the woman at the well. She lived a life of debauchery. And the groups of men that she had been with were as wicked as well. And she had come to the well to draw water. Now, she didn't come at the normal time of day. She'd gone in the middle of the day. You see, the women would go out and draw their water early in the morning and late in the evening. But this woman came by herself. She wasn't living in community. She didn't live with friendships. She lived in shame. She lived a, a, a horrible life. She lived a life that had been judged and condemned. And in the middle of the day, she met someone at that well, and his name is Jesus. He begins to tell her all that she's ever done in her life. She had lived a life where people had condemned her and judged her, and they found her life lacking. 
And I thought about, man, how that relates with so many people today. Have you ever been judged and condemned and found lacking in the eyes of other people? Have you ever been elevated or evaluated and held to a scrutiny of others saying that you didn't measure up? Of others telling you that you are a dark person, that you're living in a dark place and you don't have much hope. There's no hope, there's no rescue, there's no salvage. Has that ever happened? But that's the story of this woman. And Jesus speaks to her and he tells her everything that she's ever done. And she recognizes that he's the Christ. And she goes to that well at the same time of the day, every day. And in her condemning uh, uh, self and in her judge self and in her cast out self, she's there alone. And she's in a place of darkness. And here she meets the Savior and she discovers God is present, not absent. She meets Jesus Christ sent from the Father, empowered by the Spirit to bring us back. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, the Bible tells us when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and resting on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And right here in this moment, we see this perfect joy of community of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Spirit descends and the Father announces. And it makes John 3.16 make all the sense in the world. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes upon Him should not perish but have eternal life life. And Jesus came to bring us back to the Father by the Spirit's power. He came to rescue us from our chaos and our confusion, from our life's derailments and and our life's failures, from our sin, from the deepest and the darkest sins of our lives. The disciples had been with Jesus and he told them to set out the sail and he would meet them on the other side. They set out to sail. They're on their way to the land of the Gerdines. And suddenly a storm rises and overtakes them, and, and their boat's being tossed back and forth. The waves are crashing over. The wind's blowing hard. All that different kind of stuff, right? And they look out on the water, and they think, oh, man, it's a ghost on top of all this. I mean, their life had gone from peace and calm and the miracles of Jesus and a total confusion and darkness and despair. And Jesus said, it's not a ghost, it is I. And the disciples cried out, save us. Lord Jesus, save us. And he calmed the wind. He calmed the storm. And they found out that even in the unexpected darkness, the unexpected storms of life, the unexpected things that happen in our lives every day, that God is present. He is not absent. So Jesus calmed the storm, the sun came out, and they arrived on the other side, like I said, in the land of the Gerdines. And there they meet a man. This guy is, lo, is, lo, is loco crazy. He's so loco crazy, he's living out among the tombs. He's a man without hope. He's a man without purpose. He's a man without community. He's a man who is detached. He's living in the place of death. And there, the Lord Jesus comes, and he performs a miraculous rescue. He performs an awesome salvage. And the man begs to go with Jesus, and Jesus says, No, you stay and tell others. But Jesus didn't stop there. Over this past week, we have watched him from Palm Sunday to today. We've watched him come to Jerusalem. Seven days ago, he was applauded and he was held as king. Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest. Applauded and hailed. Palm branches waved and fell to the ground. Coats were thrown down before him. And Thursday came and he was arrested. And over the next 72 hours, Jesus would fulfill prophecy. He would redeem. He would rescue. He would salvage a lost world. He would die on a cross on Friday. And when he went to that cruel cross and when he died, the Lord Jesus Christ 
created a path. He created a path to, uh, for our restoration. He created a path for us being salvaged. He created a path rebuilding a relationship between man and God. If you would think for just a moment of a place that's the darkest, most wretched place on earth. If you think about that cross, a place of humility, a place of torture, a place of shame, a place of crucifixion, a place of death, what does that say about humanity? What does that say about human beings that we would create such a place as that to shame, to torture, and to kill? What does that say about us? What does that say about us? How dark is our thinking that we would deliberately create such a place? And that's exactly what we did. And ultimately, we created the Creator, the Son of God, the one who created the heavens and the earth, the beauty on which we live. The beauty of that bright red and orange sunset on Friday night after he was taken down from the cross that we saw across the coast here. That's what we did. We crucified him. John in, one, in John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Son of God came to this place, and He bore our sins, He bore our darkness, and, and, and it was at this place of Golgotha, this place of the skull, He was nailed to the cross. He was tortured, He was nailed there, and He hung there until He died. How deep is our darkness? What's darker than that? What's darker than all of our sins and our transgressions and our iniquities? when we curse on Him and when we spit Him and when we condemn Him and we mock Him, how dark is our darkness? Peter said, He Himself. When that's written in the Greek, it's a bearing down that it was not just an animation. It wasn't somebody else taking His place. He was bearing down that Jesus Christ Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree that we might die to sin, that we might live to righteousness by His wounds, you've been healed. Remember Isaiah said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned our own way. And the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. And there was a centurion who had been standing guard there. Doubtless he had stood over many a crucifixion. And the Bible tells us in Matthew 27 that when that centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake, and what took place. They were filled with awe, and they said, Truly, this must be the Son of God. Truly, this was the Son of God. And what they began to understand, and even in that darkest of dark places, that God is present. He's not absent. Jesus had died in that darkest of places around 3 o'clock, and at 5 o'clock his body was taken down, and it was buried, and it was placed in a tomb, and it was sealed. Now talk about a tomb, that's the darkest of places. I mean, nobody wants to be buried. I remember my mother, kind of a particular lady, she required me to vacuum the downstairs when I was in high school every morning before I went to school. Crazy. I mean, we didn't get a lot to wear our shoes in the house. We took them off outside, you know. Why did it need vacuuming, right? But my mother... She said, you know, I don't mind dying. I'm ready to go see Jesus. I just don't want to be laid down in that bright red clay in the darkness. What a dark place it is. What a dark place it is. But can I tell you this morning that God is present and not absent. Because we've got to hold on. It might be Friday. It might be five in the afternoon. But Sunday is coming. God is present. The promise of resurrection. God is present, not absent. And we read in Matthew 28. Now the Sabbath. After the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and other Mary went to the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven. And they came and they rolled the stone out. And, and they sat on it. 
Remember last week, we talked about this crying out thing a little bit that we talked about the week before. The, the, the one word that, that uh, was, cry, was to cry with Mary. The other was to cry over Jerusalem. And then there's another word that uh, identifies with an object. And that object that it was identified with, this kind of crying out, was identified with a crow. And, and those religious leaders were telling Jesus to tell his disciples to calm down, to quiet down, to shh, let's play the quiet game. And Jesus said, if we play the quiet game, that these very stones will cry out. And that cry out was the cry of a crow. And can I tell you that the rocks did cry out. That cry of the crow, crow, crow. The earth shook. The sun grew dark. Sunday morning, the earth shook. The stone rolled away. The stones cried out, God is present, not absent. And think about that gift of the resurrection. In the Gospel of John in chapter 20, we read about Thomas. You know, Thomas is known for being doubted, doubting Thomas. He was one of the twelve, the scripture tells us. And he was not with him when Jesus came, so the other disciples told him. And they said, we've seen the Lord, man. And he says, I'm not going to believe. I'm not going to believe unless I can put my hand in that, in that nail-pierced side. Unless I can put my hand in those nail-scarred hands. And eight days later, the disciples, are, they're inside again. They're hiding in fear. And Jesus comes into the room. And in those eight days later, the doors were shut. Jesus came and he stood among them and said, Peace with you. And then he said to Thomas, Thomas, put your finger right here. You see my hands? Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve. Thomas, what are you thinking? Where are you? Not a place of geography, but a place of where he is in his heart, in his mind, in his soul. He said, Thomas, I didn't just create in you and and blow you like a bubble to, to drift aimlessly and to wind down to nothing. He said, stop that doubting and believe. Stop doubting and believe. Stop doubting and believe. And over and over again, God comes to us in a a mission for our salvage. And he tells us this truth. He says, God is present, not absent. And it doesn't matter where you are in life. You know, you may be the most looked up to uh, disciple in your church. And you know that God's present and not absent. You may be a struggler along with a bunch of other fellow strugglers. And God's saying, I'm present and not absent. Isn't that awesome that God is here? That's what the name Emmanuel means. God with us. God with us. This morning I want to challenge you. You know, doubtless there are people here that have never entered into that relationship with God, that intimate relationship where you know Him, that fulfilling relationship where you recognize Him continuously. I want to invite you to consider asking Christ to be your Savior and your Lord. Just say, God, I need you. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I ask you to be in my life. And in a moment as we sing, if you'd like, I'd like to invite you to come and let me pray with you and let us give you some things that will help you along the way. Because God's present. He's not absent. Some of you, like these three girls that were baptized this morning, you're ready to be baptized and and make that public proclamation of your faith. You would come and say, Pastor, I want to be baptized. Some of you this morning, you're looking for a great church home. You had not quite figured out the commute between Memphis and here, but that's okay. (laughs) But seriously, you know, we all need to be a part of community. We all need to be together. And we invite you to come. Right now I'm going to pray as our music team's getting ready to lead us in this song of decision. And as I pray, I'm praying for you that God has touched your heart. Because God 
is present, not absent. Heavenly Father, we bow before you this morning and we thank you for this tremendous Resurrection Sunday in which we celebrate that the grave could not handle him and, the, and, the, and death could not hold him. That Jesus, the Son of God, has risen just as he said. And Lord, we come this morning, we surrender our lives, we ask you to work in us fresh in you, to open our, our eyes that we may see your presence and and dismiss the lie of your absence. Father, be glorified in these moments. For it's in Christ we pray. Amen.